Well, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you today. I want to welcome everyone that's visiting with us. We're certainly happy that you've come to be with us today. hope that you'll find everything that we do here in accordance with what the Bible teaches. Uh, in the lesson of the hour, we'd like to talk about some more, uh, uh, another quality that we need to personally develop ourselves as Christians and to be successful in life of uh, serving the Lord and having a, uh, a good uh, personal uh, life as well, and that is the quality of forgiveness. And as the song that Nathan led, we're following the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ on how to live as uh, people as we should. Jesus was a perfect example of manhood and, and how we should behave ourselves, and he was one, of course, known for the quality of forgiveness. We've all come to enjoy, as Christians, His great forgiveness. That motivates us to want to have a duty since we've been forgiven of so many sins and uh, fallen so short in our relationship to God that we have a duty to pass on this mercy and compassion and forgiving attitude towards other people. And it is something that helps us have a liberating principle working in our life. Um, where was a sister that uh, had had uh, reason to have uh, a broken relationship with another woman in the church, and uh, the woman came back and wanted to be forgiven and restored to fellowship and receive uh, mercy and forgiveness, and the woman that was went up to her afterwards and told how happy she was she'd come back to church and said, now I feel free, <laughs> that uh, there is a freedom in forgiving people and being able to enter in again to a good relationship with someone. Uh, as long as forgiveness isn't there, it is a kind of a personal prison that you're in. So there is a, certainly a great quality for ourselves in forgiving. It's a blessing to us to do what God tells us to do. All of His laws are given to us for our benefit, because they're good for us, and the idea of forgiving other people is good for us. <laughs> it is a quality that we need to have. We're told in Genesis 41 and verses 51, Joseph had been, of course, sold into the land of Egypt, and uh, he'd been falsely accused in the house of Potiphar and put in jail, and had been through many afflictions and a lot of things. He could have had bitterness and uh, ill will about, but we're told that... Uh, of course, God raised him up there in the land of Egypt. He had a wife, and then he had some children. And the statement is made that Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. So he'd forgotten and able to let go of all of that abuse and envy and slavery and lustful conniving that he had had in the past. And it is a freeing thing to forget those things and move on and be able to forgive. He had a forgiving spirit, and we see that exercised in the book, that once his brothers came to him and uh, he revealed himself to them, that he had forgiven them for their sins, and he looked out for them. He recognized that all the things that had happened in his life were a matter of God's providence and judgment, and he was free within to be able to enjoy his life. So there is power in forgiveness, and it is a great thing to be forgiven. You, you don't end up in a prison where you're full of resentment and bitterness and other people are controlling your mind and your life by the things that they do. Uh, one poet, Richard Lovelace, said, Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a heritage or a hermitage. And... The opposite is true. You have a calm and forgiving spirit, you're free. And that's the house you want to live in. The opposite is also true, that if you're unforgiving, it makes a prison of bitterness for yourself in life. So it's best to uh, let Jesus uh, take over your life and control you with this attitude of forgiveness and to build up that personal quality of being uh, seeking to have opportunity to forgive others, and whenever one repents, to freely, heartily forgive people from the heart. We all 
uh, sin and we all make mistakes. James said we all stumble in many ways. And if the, uh, James, the Lord's brother, he stumbled in many ways, then I know that I do too and that all of us as uh, human beings do. So there's going to be a lot of room given to us to practice forgiveness. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. We recognize that we are sinful people, that we are sinners. We uh, fall short. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's going to be occasion where we're going to have to seek the forgiveness of God. And we need to be willing to forgive others if we want to enjoy God's forgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer where Jesus was giving a model prayer to his apostles and disciples of how to pray during his earthly ministry. He said, Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So there needs to be uh, Forgiveness from God is something we regularly need to pray for, is that God will forgive us of of ways in which we fall short of His will. But in order to enjoy that forgiveness, we need to have a forgiving attitude ourselves. It is a condition of our forgiveness, is that we have a forgiving heart and a forgiving spirit. So to develop as we should and be happy in life and happy with God, we need to constantly be trying to Imitate the Lord in being willing to forgive. Part of forgiving is also forgiving yourself. When we all make mistakes, we all stumble, we all fall short. I can think of a number of things that pop up in my mind from time to time. I wish I hadn't have said that. Why in the world was I so stupid to <laughs> make that comment or whatever, uh, maybe years ago. And part of being a Christian is you've got to be able to accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself and move on to what your duty is now and not let those things uh, capture you and keep you from doing what needs to be done. In Philippians 3 verses 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. He's talking about perfection that we'll have at the resurrection. So I ha- Paul said he wasn't a perfect person. He hadn't laid hold on that yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had made grievous mistakes in the past, held the garments of those that stoned Stephen to death. And I'm sure he made many mistakes after that. He said, one thing I do in my life in striving for the perfection that's out there is I forget about yesterday and I move on to tomorrow trying to do God's will. He forgave himself. He reached for better things. He was forgiven by Christ, though he was the chief of sinners in his own mind. And he kept trying to grow in his character and bear good fruit. And part of that good fruit is forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the fruits that we need to bear for God in order to please him and to offer a service that is acceptable to him. The Apostle Paul talks about laying off the deeds of the flesh, mortifying them, putting them to death, and then replacing them with these qualities that the gospel teaches us, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So with this spirit of forgiveness, he says we need to bear good fruit. We need to show that we're a good tree. (laughs) that bears good fruit, that we practice true religion and that involves practicing forgiveness and having an attitude of forgiveness, that we bear with one another. We all uh, make mistakes, we're all imperfect, we all do things that are annoying sometimes, we commit sins of omission towards one another where we leave things undone and so on, but we need to be forbearing, holding, enduring with a forgiving spirit one another if we're going to keep unity in the church because we are all flawed people that are still trying to grow to be exactly like Jesus Christ. Forgiving, it means pardoning, to be gracious towards what the Greek dictionary says. Wholeheartedly excusing faults or offenses to stop feeling anger for or resentment against. So there's the forgiving spirit that we need to practice towards one another. 
in our personal relationships if we want to develop our character as it should be. Whoever has a complaint, the word there means a dissatisfaction, a blame uh, uh, for the errors of omission, things that other people are leaving undone that we think they should have done, different forms of debt in our personal relationships. Let those things go. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Uh, the Lord, how does He forgive us? Well, He's long-suffering toward us. He holds back His anger from us. He treats us kindly and tries to win us over to a change of mind, repentance, so that we lay aside the things we're leaving undone and not doing the right thing. He sent His Son to die for us to provide us with an avenue of forgiveness. That's the forgiving attitude of God. He encouraged us to repent through the teaching of the gospel and all of His kind dealings with us that lead us to repentance. And then when we repented, He freely forgives us of our sins. We should so deal with one another if we're going to imitate the Lord and be pleasing in His sight and be happy people. There is bigness to forgiveness. It shows a, a good character and quality, an excellent nature if you're forgiving. And God wants us to be excellent in the things that we do. One of the things that we show in being willing to forgive and have a forgiving spirit and seeking opportunity to forgive is we show an understanding of the nature of our fellow man. That our people in this world are just like us. That they do many things not out of an, out, uh, an actual maliciousness but out of ignorance people act toward us. And just like we are often mistaken in many things in our judgments that we make, so are our fellow man. Jesus shows even at the time of His crucifixion when they were nailing Him to the cross, He was praying that those people might be forgiven. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots and divided up His garments among them. He had an understanding that even though they knew they were crucifying this man and they were nailing him there, they didn't really understand who he was and that he was really the Son of God. He was being condemned as a blasphemer, somebody claiming to be Lord in place of Caesar, but he really was the spiritual Lord of everybody. They didn't know that. And the Lord prayed that they might have opportunity to be forgiven. He didn't want the Lord to hold this sin against them and His wrath to be poured out on them. So He prayed for them. He was loving them. He wanted them to have patience, to have an opportunity to seek salvation. So He had a good will toward them. And, of course, the Lord answered that prayer, didn't He? There were many people that were involved in that crucifixion that we read about on the day of Pentecost. The same Jesus that you crucified... God has made him both Lord and Christ. And people were touched in their hearts. They pierced in their heart, repented, and were baptized and forgiven of their sins that day. So the Lord was praying with a forgiving spirit towards them that we need to imitate in the way we treat each other and our fellow man. It is big to forgive because it involves being merciful. And that is a great quality and an attribute that God has, and as people made in His image that are saved by the Lord's blood, we ought to be merciful above all others. In Matthew 18 and verse 27, the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. You remember this man owed uh, 10,000 talents to the king that he had misappropriated or, or had uh, not managed properly. And he came and fell down and begged the king for forgiveness. He said, I'll repay it all. I don't know how he was ever going to do it. It was an unpayable sum. But it, it, his a plea for forgiveness, the, the king looked down, and he's an illustration of God's forgiveness, and he forgave him the whole debt. And then, of course, we know the man's great uh, wickedness was that he went out to his fellow servant that just owed him a little bit of money, and he was very harsh when he was asked to forgive and had him imprisoned because of that. And uh, the king heard about it and he reversed his decision. He was thrown into jail and was, he was going to have to pay the whole amount. And it shows we're forgiven of our sins. God forgives us an unpayable debt 
of all of the sins we've committed in our lives when we obey the gospel. And many times afterwards we ask His forgiveness. We have a debt and a duty. If we've been shown such great mercy, to be big of heart and be merciful to others if we want to continue in the grace of God. So this bigness is also the ability to forget, the ability to treat the person as if these things had not happened and restore our relationship to them. That's the kind of forgiveness that God modeled for us in the gospel. When the New Testament was uh, foretold by Jeremiah, it's quoted in Hebrews 10 and verse 17, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. The Lord wipes the slate clean when we obey the gospel. Just like you take a wax tablet in those days that they would write the debts that people owed them at a business, and when you paid off the debt, they just wipe out that wax tablet. God has wiped out our sins, and He remembers that debt against us no more. <laughs> and He forgives us. And we try... Uh, to model that as well in the way that we treat other people when they repent and they're forgiven. In Isaiah 43 and verse 25, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So more than once the Lord foretold the forgiveness of this new covenant. It is big, this forgiving heart that we're to have. The bigness of the forgiving person is seen in how numberless the times are that you're willing to forgive those that ask forgiveness and repent. We're told in Matthew chapter 18 and verses 21 and 22, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Peter thought he was offering up a big number there. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. So this forgiveness is something that we need to have in an unlimited uh, manner that we're willing to forgive those that turn again and uh, want to restore a right relationship. The Pharisees placed limits. Christ and Christians, we don't have a limit on this forgiveness. And as often as one repents, we should forgive. And live with an attitude of forgiving and seeking forgiveness and not be people filled with bitterness and cursing, but wanting to give a blessing to people instead. It's also seen in helpfulness, this quality of forgiveness. Um, that you actually try to do good to people that have wronged you. That you have this spirit of forgiveness that leads you, even though they're your enemies, you try to treat them in the right way and through kindness lead them to repent and to see that they ought to change their life. That's what God does by sending the rain on the evil and the good, on sending His blessings on people whether they're worshiping Him today or not. He's trying to win them over to His goodness. He wants His people to reflect that same thing. We've been studying the word agape in the fruit of the Spirit, that goodwill, unconquerable goodwill towards other people. Uh, in Matthew 5 and verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You continue to seek their highest good. Pray for their repentance and forgiveness. And follow Christ's illustration of it by praying for those people at the cross. He prayed for them. Even though they were abusing Him, He was praying for their good seeking their repentance and forgiveness. And we have also the example of our beloved brother Stephen. Stephen preached the gospel, and for that reason he was being stoned to death. But even in that moment that they were throwing rocks at him, he bowed and he prayed, lifting up his eyes to heaven, that their sins would not be held against them. And in Acts 7 and verse 60, Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. So what a powerful example of the first martyr to die for the faith that he prayed for those persecutors. What an example to strive to live up to and what a noble character uh, Stephen had. It is godlike to forgive. We're told in Psalms 86 and verse 5, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. What a great God we serve, 
that He's ready to forgive us when we go to Him and ask Him to be merciful to us as sinners. Uh, to err is human, is the saying, and to forgive is divine, and I think that's true. Err is human. We all fall short. We all sin. We say we have no sin, we make God a liar. Uh, God and Christ freely forgive because they're big hearted. They have that great divine quality. And God hears the prayers because He's good. He is merciful because He is uh, a holy God, ready to forgive. And all that are penitent sinners, we should wish to be like our Heavenly Father and pass on that same form of forgiveness to others. The tax gatherer and the, and the and the Pharisee stood or in the temple says, But the tax gatherer standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He had that humble attitude before God and he went down to his house justified rather than the other, Jesus says. So God forgives like that. We should treat one another that way and be willing to be free with our forgiveness. It's the wronged person's glory to forgive is what we're told in the book of Proverbs. We talk about living a wise life, a noble life. Um, it's the person that's truly wise and discerning that has a forgiving spirit towards other people. A man's dis discretion makes him slow to anger. It is his glory to overcome a transgression or to overlook a transgression. So forgiveness distinguishes somebody as a big person. <laughs> Unwillingness to forgive makes you a little person in, the, in this proverb, doesn't it? Who is the person that's really got discretion and has got a reason to boast and to be glorious? It is because he forgives. Generous and magnanimous, magnanimous uh, minds are readiest to forgive, and it is a weakness and an impotency of mind to be unable to forgive, is what Lord Byron in one of his statements made, or Bacon, uh, it says, a triumph and a glory to forgive is what the proverb says. You're imitating Almighty God, and certainly that is something uh, to be proud that you do. It's something to glory in, and it shows discretion, prudence, caution, self-restraint. When you look up that Hebrew word there for discretion, an intelligent person restrains himself and is over, able to overlook the annoyances of other people. And so let's put on that quality of personal development. A good life cannot go uh, without forgiving and forgetting. We're told in the book of Leviticus, in Leviticus 19, 18, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbors as yourself. I am the Lord. So we're not to have a grudge. A grudge means to guard, to keep, to cherish anger to bear a grudge. The dictionary says a grudge is a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past injury or insult. So we need to be those that have this loving attitude towards other people that we're seeking their good rather than carrying around ill will and resentment towards others. Spurgeon in one of his sermons said that when you, you should bury the past and when you bury the mad dog says don't leave his tail above the ground don't have that grudge put that out of your mind let it go and start praying for the good of other people uh, an awareness of how much I need to forgive these are some of the motivations to forgive in Matthew 7 and verse 3 and why do you look at the speck that is in your neighbor or your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye so we need to first examine ourselves before we're holding grudges or putting down other people that are around us because of their faults. Think about your own faults first. <laughs> that motivates you to be kind, to have a forgiving spirit, to seek to be merciful and compassionate to others and bring them to repentance. So first look to yourself. Those guilty of the of wrong find it harder to forgive others guilty of the same wrong a lot of times. In psychology, it's called projection. It's a way of 
uh, fighting or hiding from your own sins. It's that you treat other people that do the same thing. You project your stuff onto them to make yourself feel better. Well, no, why don't you rather see your own sins, repent of them, ask forgiveness, and be merciful and kind towards others that need the same thing. So there's a hum uh, humility in self-examination of our own weaknesses and faults. We know about them more than we know about anybody else's. And Jesus says, first look to the log in your own eye. In Matthew 6 and verse 15, But if you do not forgive men, then your father, who, uh, your father will not forgive your transgressions. Wow, there's a motivation to be forgiving. <laughs> I want to be forgiven. And if I'm not forgiving, then I won't be forgiven. So there's a motivation to, to pray for this quality, to try to uh, exercise it in every way that we possibly can, to imitate God's goodness and mercy and compassion as we're dealing with each other. My forgiveness is conditioned on forgiving. When you have a forgiving spirit and you practice forgiving other people, it is a recognition of humanity's fallibility uh, and goodness and urgency for clemency that we all have. Uh, Robert Baxter, a Puritan preacher and poet back in the 1600s, he said about his life as he looked back over it, I see that good men are not as good as I once thought they were, and I find that few men are as bad as their enemies imagine. And that's about true. A lot of times people aren't as good or bad as you might have thought in the past. And that comes with experience and age and living life that you begin to see that that is so. Uh, a meditative stroll through a cemetery is mentioned by one writer when talking about this quality of forgiveness. The poet talks about going to the cemetery and how that helped him to have a more forgiving attitude <laughs> right now and sometimes a funeral when somebody maybe that uh, you hope that before they die you set things right and you don't have a bad thought but isn't it sad to think about somebody dies and you were out on the outs with them and you could have forgave them and now they're you never get that opportunity uh, so John Greenleaf Whittier he says I strolled among the green mounds of the valley of the village burial place where pondering how all human love and hate find one sad level, awed for myself and pitying my race depart, our common sorrow, like a mighty wave, swept all my pride away, and trembling I forgave. So he thought about that common place we're all going, and it's time to forgive and not hold a grudge. So forgiveness is something that is offered to us by our Heavenly Father, and it is conditional. There needs to be, on the part of anyone turning back to God, we need to repent of our sins. A number of passages talk about uh, our brother. When he repents, forgive him. There needs to be a turning away from the wrong course and turning to the right course. In Luke 17 and verse 3, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Let's grant that forgiveness. If you're here today and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, we want to encourage you by the love of God, by the sacrifice of Christ, by the gracious offer of mercy in the gospel to reconcile yourself to God. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, that He is both Lord and Christ, that God raised Him from the dead. You need to repent of your sins. Repentance comes from sorrow over sin. It's a change of mind, a renouncing of sin in your heart and a turning to the right way to where you bring forth fruit of repentance. And you need to confess Christ that He is Lord and then you're a proper subject to be baptized into Christ. Buried with Him in baptism into His death and you can arise from that water by the power of God to walk in newness of life, having your heart and conscience sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to do so. As Christians, we're to walk in the light as He is in the light. If you've stopped 
walking in the light as you should and stop making that progress that is right. You need to repent and get back on the right path. We have the promise if we'll confess our sins, the Lord will be faithful to forgive us. If you need to respond to the invitation in any way, we want to encourage you to do so as together we stand and sing.